Sun has about 5 billion years to live. Does this mean we will go homeless? Well, actually only if humans survive till then, or any other species for that matter. But for sure, evolution has its role to play. Let's begin. So starting with what nuclear fusion is. Now we would not discuss the details, I have linked a few articles in the description. You can check that out for now. Alternatively, I may upload a video on nuclear physics. Back to the topic. The sun produces energy in the form of heat and light. But there has to be a source of energy. It is found that the sun is majorly composed of hydrogen and helium atoms. You might wonder how the smallest atoms that exist produce energy at an extent that lights up our earth and heat it to 50 degrees Celsius. The energy radiated by the sun is produced through core thermonuclear fusion reactions which converts hydrogen into helium. These reactions generate profuse amount of energy that then travels towards the photosphere and then into the space. These reactions initiated at the time the sun was formed and carried on ever since. We know that the first element of the periodic table, hydrogen, weighs 1.00784 unified atomic mass. Now we also know for hydrogen to get stability, it tries to follow Dupré's law. But that's just electrons. And if you think about it, with immense pressure and temperature, you can provide it a suitable environment as well as the energy required to convert itself into helium, the nearest stable element. Helium is the second element of the periodic table that weighs 4.002602u. Again, when four hydrogen comes together to fuse into helium, if you do the math, then the total mass of four hydrogen is 4.03136u as opposed to 4.002602u, mass of helium. Difference thus becomes 0.028758u. Now, where does the rest of the mass go? It is converted to energy. The amount of energy thus formed when converted from mass by using Einstein's equation E is equal to mc squared, we get 6.8 million electron volt or in other words 1.0894800 times 10 to the power negative 6 joules. You can just imagine how much energy is produced through nuclear fusion. The light and the heat that we see is nothing but this energy. Now, if you divide this number by the mass of 4 hydrogen and multiply it with 100, you get that this is merely 0.7% of the initial mass. So we can say that only 0.7% of this is converted to energy. We will get back to this in a while. Second thing that we must know is the distance between the earth and the sun. Although it won't help us directly, but yeah, we will see where it will help us. Let's find it out. How we will find the distance is a big question. You cannot go measuring it with a measuring tape. It's impractical. Well, do you know how the air traffic controllers finds out how far the airplane is? They require the distance to command the pilots. They send out radio waves, which then collides with the fuselage of the plane and travels back to the radar receiver and calculates the distance through the time it took. Similar procedure can be used to find out the distance in space. But sun is composed of plasma. Wait, but Venus is neither a gas giant nor made of plasma. It can send the waves back. But how finding the distance between Venus and the Earth is ever going to help us find the distance between Earth and the Sun? Well, we can easily find the distance between Venus and Earth and we can also measure the angle between Venus and the Sun from Earth. We can simply use the basic trigonometry function here that is cosine. But when does Venus make a 90 degree between Earth and the Sun? Well, it is called greatest elongation. The angle measured from the Earth between the direction to the Sun and the direction to a planet. A planet can be at an eastern or a western elongation, depending on whether the planet lies to the east or the west of the Sun as seen from the Earth. The elongation for a superior planet can vary from 0 degree to whooping 180 degree. Inferior planets, however, range between 0 degree and a greatest elongation. That is 28 degree for Mercury and 48 degree for Venus. By the way, next Venus's greatest elongation is, is going to be on June 4th, 2023. Look out for it. See, a small concept of trigonometry is used to find a huge distance. Anyways, the distance thus formed is measured to be 150 million kilometers approximately. Did you know that this distance is taken to be an ideal distance or taken as a reference for astronomical distances? and is known as astronomical unit. Now, how will we find the mass of the sun? It is required as that is the fuel for the reaction. 
Newton's law of universal gravitation, which states that any particle of matter in the universe attracts any other with a force varying directly as the product of the masses and inversely as the square of the distance between them. Now, we know that a force exists between Earth and the Sun. We also know that the force of gravitation is central. Therefore, it acts on the given line. Now, we also know that there exists a centrifugal force between Earth and the Sun. This force is again central. Therefore, we can equate them as both of them are equal. g, the gravitational constant valuing at 6.67430 times 10 to the power negative 11 newton meter square per kg square, multiplied with the product of the mass of the earth and that of the sun, divided by the radius or distance squared, which is equated to the mass of the earth times the velocity of the square, divided by the radius. Now, here we know the universal gravitational constant, the mass of the sun and that of the earth, the distance between the earth and the sun as discussed just earlier. What we don't know is the velocity. We know velocity is equal to distance upon time. Distance is just the circumference here or the orbit here. So just going to be 2 pi r. The time now is going to be 1 year. That's the time it takes to orbit the orbit of the earth around the sun. 1 year is going to be 365.25 days. Now we know the velocity. It is unnecessary to find the exact value for now. Again, back to the equation. When the mass of the sun is isolated, it is going to be the distance times the velocity squared divided by the universal gravitational constant, which is equal to 4 pi squared times distance cubed divided by the constant times the time cubed, which then becomes 2 times 10 to the power 30 kilograms approximately. 2 with 30 zeros is just so huge. That's 330,000 Earths. Okay, so we discussed earlier that the energy that is produced through nuclear fusion is then converted to heat and light. Now, the light or the electromagnetic energy is what we see. This energy makes the sun luminous. But how do we calculate this luminosity? So, actually we refer to something that is called apparent brightness. Apparent brightness is nothing but the amount of brightness that we observe from the surface of the earth. So. For example, let's take the other star as the sun. Now the light that we observe from earth, that is the sunlight, is the apparent brightness of the sun. That is observed from the earth. It is also known as this flux. Now the simple formula for flux is luminosity upon the surface area of earth, that is 4 pi r square. Now you might wonder, how do we get the luminosity of the sun? As we are trying to find just that. Let's take the example of solar panel. The energy that is trapped inside one solar cell can be calculated and thus we can get the flux of that area. Now simply we can use the direct proportionality. Therefore the luminosity becomes the flux times the surface area of earth. In this way we can find the total luminosity of the sun and that comes out to be somewhat around 3.86 times 10 to the power 26 watts. In astronomy values of luminosity are often given in terms of luminosity of the sun that is L with the symbol of sun. It is taken as a reference just as we saw in the case of astronomical unit. Now that we have mostly everything, we may begin with our actual calculation. So we are supposed to find time. Now we know the equation E is equal to mc squared. We also know that luminosity of the sun is equal to energy upon time, as luminosity basically is the power. Now in place of energy, we can substitute mass of the sun and the speed of light squared from Einstein's equation. Furthermore, we are supposed to find the time, so isolating time, we get mass of the sun times the speed of light squared divided by the luminosity of the sun. Therefore, the time becomes 2 times 10 to the power 30 times 300 million squared divided by 3.8 times 10 to the power 26. Now, the time that we will get is in seconds, which when converted to years, we get almost 15 trillion years. That is a lot. It is not accurate, right? Sun cannot have enough fuel to run its reactions forever. Alternatively, it must be of a greater mass. So wait, where did we go from? We actually forgot something. The fuel that is the hydrogen is only present in its core. Furthermore, the required environment for the reaction is only available in the 10% of the entire mass of the sun. Now, the question comes, how do we know the mass of the core of the sun? Here, helioseismology comes into play. Again, I would not go into the details here as this is a complete topic in itself. Although, I highly recommend watching the YouTube video linked in the description and in the i button on the top right corner. Back to the topic. Helio means sun 
and seismology, as you may know, is the science of earthquakes. So you must have guessed, it is the study of earthquakes that takes place in the sun. To study these earthquakes, researchers use different kinds of waves, like sound waves. Through this, a lot of information is extracted. For this video, we will stick to the mass of the core of the sun. Now, we know that the mass of the sun, we just want to know how much percentage is the mass of the core of the sun to that of the sun. So, from this, we know that in only about 10% of the sun is the temperature high enough to sustain fusion reactions. Coming to the equation that we got earlier, time becomes mass of the core of the sun times the speed of the light squared divided by the luminosity of the sun. Also, from one nuclear fusion reaction, we get 0.7% of energy. So if you do the math, then you will get 0.007% energy extracted from the total reactions going on in the sun. Therefore, time becomes 0.007 times 0.1, that is 10%, times 2 times 10 to the power 30, times 300 million squared, divided by 3.8 times 10 to the power 26, which then becomes 10.5 billion years, the more agreed value. Now, our sun is a G2V type star, or G type main sequence star. A little extra fact, a G type main sequence star are called the yellow dwarf with almost about one solar mass and the temperature is between about 5300 and 6000 Kelvin. Now these stars have enough hydrogen to fuel the reactions for about 10 billion years. If you want to read more about G2B type stars or G type main sequence star, please uh, check the link below in the description. Now that we know the life expectancy of the sun, that is about 10 billion years, but to deduct the time that the sun has left to live, we need its age. Like for the moon, we can analyze the rocks. But wait, all the stars and planets etc. in our solar system almost came at the same time. So we can look for any objects in the solar system. You might wonder, then why don't we take some rocks from Earth and check its age? It's not that simple, as all the rocks and minerals on Earth are pre-processed. What that means is, they have undergone a lot of changes because of earthquakes, volcanoes etc. One object that we can look for are meteorites. Meteorites are solid pieces of debris from an object such as comet, asteroid, meteoroid that originates in outer space and survives its passage through the atmosphere. Now, these objects carry a lot of information. Alternatively, lunar rocks can be used. So, from all the Apollo missions that stepped on the surface of the Earth, 382 kilograms of lunar rock and other samples were brought back. Now, these two can be used to estimate the age of the Sun. So basically lunar rocks and meteorites are used. So we get almost 4.5 billion years. Now using basic subtraction, we can get almost 5.5 billion years, which by the way is a great estimate for we have just looked for approximate values of all the variables. So there you go. Although even this number is not completely accurate as established. But that is because we ignored some of the conditions, like sun increases its brightness by a whooping 10% every billion years. Now we may not be able to see this, but the sun is brighter than what it used to be. The other condition is that the mass of the sun was different from what it is today. So there are other conditions too, but for today we have come to the end of this video. Also, if you want to read more, you can check for other links in the description which interest you and are related to the topic of this video. Thank you for watching this video.